Um, we've got a great panel uh, this afternoon and I'll introduce each of our speakers um, as they come up to speak. The title of this afternoon's meeting is After COP21, Are We Too Late to Stop Climate Change? Um, we'll have uh, each of the speakers speak for about 10 minutes and then uh, we will open the floor up for uh, discussion, debate, questions and contributions. So our first speaker this afternoon is Asad Raymond. Asad uh, heads up international climate at Friends of the Earth and is active in the climate movement nationally and internationally. Asad. Thank you. Um, I'm active in the climate justice movement. There's a very <laughs> difference between the cl broader climate movement and I think the climate justice movement. So the topic of, of course, this session is after COP21, are we too late to stop climate change? Well, first of all, um, I suppose it depends on where you are in the world. Now, for the poorest people in the world, for the most vulnerable, climate change is already happening. It's impacting on people's lives. Now, we have all heard and seen, and now you don't need to be a climate scientist to know the realities we've had. The, this month was the 13th warmest month ever in history. It's broken uh, all temper, temperature records. We've had vanishing Arctic Sea. We've had the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, in Pakistan, where I'm from, we have a, a drought which is now at 53 degrees centigrade. The government is digging mass graves. Last year, when the drought hit uh, Pakistan, three and a half thousand people died just in the province of Sindh from that, that heat wave. We've seen the pictures of the wildfires in North America. And of course, now every single record that we have, strongest hurricane, broken. Strongest hurricane in the north, broken. Strongest hurricane in the south, broken. New temperature levels for Australia, broken. Absolutely every single record that there is has been breached. Now, this year, we even breached what was a symbolic uh, parts per million thing out there. And oh, I want to say that one of the problems of the climate movement is about talking about these abstract things, but I'm going to say it just so we've got a context, because hopefully my colleagues will be able to talk much more about what that means in, real, in reality. But the climate scientists basically said we'd breached 400 parts per million. And the Met said that within the next decade or so, uh, we will breach 450 parts per million. Now, this is important because, you know, you hear this temperature goal that people talked about, this two degree temperature goal. Um, this two degree temperature goal, by the way, you know, was plucked out of thin air. It was plucked out of thin air by the European Union. And it was plucked out of thin air. There's absolutely no basis in climate science at all. No basis in actually what the impacts are happening around the world. It was deemed to be something that the European Union felt that was achievable for them. And even at that rate, it wasn't actually at two degree temperature level. What it was was a 50-50 chance of meeting a two degree temperature level. Now, when that number was put forward, and it was put forward first in, in Copenhagen six years ago, the African group of negotiators that represent the whole of their African countries, the lead negotiator said in the plenary, that two degree target is a death sentence for the people of Africa. And we only need to now look at what's happening. If you look at the drought that's impacted the Sahel, you've had 15 million people being impacted there. Food scarcity is now affecting 23 million people and it's displaced three and a half million people. If you look in the Horn of Africa, if you look in uh, Somalia, you see the droughts that are happening. And, you know, we, we see, and I'm not, there's been lots of sessions here about migration and migrants. You know, this year, We've breached already the 3,500 people who drowned in the Mediterranean of last year, and we breached that of the previous year. And only a few weeks ago, if you remember, there was eight to 900 people who drowned in one single week in the Mediterranean. You wouldn't really know about it because the gorilla who was shot in the United States got much more coverage than the fact 900 people drowned. But those 900 people, we might know, you know, they're 900 people, but what's happened is they're kept nameless and faceless. But if you actually look at where people are coming from, they're coming from those places which are being impacted by climate change, by droughts and by famines. 
And that is the reality of the climate crisis out there. And this is something that has been predicted. The IPCC, which is the international climate scientists, when they first got together and they produced that first report in 1990, they said the first big impact will be about the mass scale global migration. That will be one of the consequences of climate change. Nicholas Stern, you know, the economist, uh, the UK, who did that big report by the economic, uh, um, the review on the economics of climate change, he said, and I quote you, hundreds of millions, probably billions of people will have to move if, the if, the, if we start to talk about a three to four to five degree world. Now, in the context of that, what happened in Paris? Well, some people will say it was a huge victory. At best, it was a diplomatic victory. We, as Friends of the Earth, we called it, you know, a poison chalice for the poor and an escape hatch for the rich. Because in reality, what was agreed there was that we would hold, and this is the binding bit, global temperatures, average temperatures, well below two degrees. And we will pursue efforts to limit the increase to one and a half degree. Now, one and a half degree, you know, the reason that one and a half degree is there is because it was pushed by the most vulnerable countries. And it was agreed in the final two days of the Paris negotiations. But it was agreed at a huge cost. Because the cost of putting that just, and that's a non-binding target, just putting that word of 1.5, the Americans and rich developed countries got a promise, a legally binding promise from poorer countries that they would not be liable for any legal compensation for future impacts of climate change. Now, when you look at what's in the Paris Agreement, it's not at 1.5, it's not at 2 degrees. The minimum, if you add up all of the, temp the targets that are in there, they add up to 3.4 degrees warming. And that's at the low scale. Other people talk about it, that actually the reality of those pledges is that we will be closer to four to five degrees warming. Some people even talk about a six degree warming. Now, the World Bank, not the most revolutionary of organisations, when it did its report last year, started talking about that the consequence of not tackling climate change would create a world which was so inhospitable that what they said, and they said that society as we know it would no longer be able to function. They started to talk about a world which would only be able to sustain about a billion people. Let's that sink in. That is one in five, six of our fellow citizens around the world who will no longer be able to sustain themselves if we start to see the kind of warming that we're seeing. Kevin Anderson, who's the professor at the Tyndall Centre, you know, in Manchester, the climate scientist, a renowned, renowned climate scientist, says basically, at the most, we've got this decade. It's this one decade. It's decade zero. Every decision we make in this decade will determine not only if we meet the one and a half degree warming, but if we meet the two and two and a half degree warming. That is what is up at, uh, in stake at the moment. And that one and a half, so you might have heard, one and a half to stay alive. The demand, in fact, the climate justice movements, particularly from the global south, try to amend that and say it's one, not one and a half to stay alive. We're barely surviving on one and a half when you look at the impacts. And we see in the Philippines, super typhoons that used to happen every 100 years started to happen every 10 years, and now every year. One typhoon, Typhoon Rian, impacted uh, uh, 30,000 people, 6,000 people dead. One flood in Pakistan in 2012, 30 million people being impacted. Now, when we see all of this, we ask ourselves, you know, where, well, surely governments are rational. Surely with this evidence in front of them, they would know, and, and that was largely the mistake of the climate movement. They thought, actually, governments were going to act rationally. All you needed to do was put the evidence in front of them, and governments will see the stark reality of it and will do something about it. But that fails to understand that actually climate is not about the environment. Climate actually is about political economy. It is about who survives, who doesn't, who maintains their wealth and who doesn't. And it's no surprise when you look at, for example, the United States, 5% of the population, an average per capita income of about $43,000, where India, with 18% of the population, has about $3,000 per capita income. And the least developed countries, the poorest, most vulnerable countries, 11% of the world have, a, have a, an income of about $1,469. Uh, it's said that climate change 
is the wind that, fl- that fans every single inequality in the world. And that is actually how we have to see it. Because tackling climate change is not about simply tackling our greenhouse gas emissions. It's actually tackling the way we can produce and consume our energy, the way we produce and consume our food, and our, basically our economic system as we know it. Now, the IPCC has already said that by 2020, 75 to 250 million people in West Africa will face water stresses. That by 2020, we'll see a 50% collapse of agriculture in large parts of Africa. Now, the UNHCR the, uh, said already that there is about 36 million people who have been displaced from their homes because of environmental reasons. And that environmental reasons are going to increase some of, I am, I am, are going to increase more and more. And when we actually look at, you know, who is responsible, the reality is there is a global elite. 10% of the world's population are responsible for 50% of global emissions, whilst 50% of the world's population are responsible for only 10% of global emissions. So simply talking about reducing emissions without talking about tackling inequality, without talking about inequity, without talking about the right for people to live a dignified life, is actually talking about tackling climate change as if you can tackle it without changing our economic system. And that is fundamentally the biggest mistake that the climate movement has made. And that is why we have to build a movement at which its core are two issues. One, justice and solidarity on the one hand, and two, a recognition that as we talk about climate change at the moment, it is depoliticizing, it is alienating people, it is talking about climate change in a technical sense, which fails to connect with ordinary people, which says that climate change is something that's going to be resolved by politicians and experts, rather than actually it has to be resolved by building a powerful movement, both in the north and in the south, and that's the way we hopefully Friends, in the coming years, how we have to build. I hope I'm running out. I did have more to say, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> As ever. Thank you, Asad. I like a speaker who's you know sticks to their time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Suzanne Jeffrey. Suzanne's a long-standing member of the SWP and a climate activist, and Suzanne will be speaking for about ten minutes as well. Okay. Thanks very much. So I'm going to just slightly, I'm afraid, repeat a little bit of what Asad has said. Uh, give me one sec. Um, that's, that's a minute gone already, isn't it? Um, okay. Um, so I want to just very quickly start from, from Paris, from the Paris Agreement, because it, you know, it was obviously ha- hailed. Um, here's a couple, these are your headlines on it. So Paris happened um, December, and uh, we had uh, a major leap forward for mankind from the Observer, a climate deal to change the world from the Times. Uh, governments have agreed to limit the increase to 1.5% from the Guardian, and it was essentially hailed as historic. And I think any kind of discussion that you had, or certainly I had with people afterwards, um, and many actually people, you know, I, I know a lot of people on the left, obviously you have a lot of conversations with people on the left, they're uh, concerned, they're engaged with this issue, but they, they knew there's something wrong with that, that doesn't quite ring true to have the ruling elites of the world claim that they've just done a historic deal uh, to so, solve the world's problems, but they weren't quite clear exactly what was wrong about them. So, well, haven't they, what have they done? They've done something, haven't they? Well, actually, uh, a lot of words, but no. The action that was agreed at Paris goes in the completely opposite direction to the claims that were made about the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement says, what was it, a climate deal to change the world, a major leap forward for, for mankind. Essentially, the Paris deal was, was this. Um, it said um, that uh, I suppose, I suppose the, the, the real achievement of the Paris uh, deal, the agreement, was not an achievement actually for the politicians that gathered in Paris. The real achievement was the movement's achievement. That after Copenhagen, after the collapse of the movement, after Copenhagen was back on its feet and uh, kept going to reassert the significance, the profile, the importance of this of this problem. So his historic only in as much as acknowledge what the climate justice movement has been arguing for years that there is an urgent and real 
health threat um, with catastrophic consequences if we don't take action. Unfortunately, is not delivering on the action at all. Um, the Paris Agreement, lots of words, the, uh, the reality means um, they essentially said that each government um, is going to sub- is, it has submitted INDCs, uh, inter- intended nationally determined contributions. By the way, these are voluntary, so there's no obligation on the governments to deliver on those intended nationally determined contributions. That's not good, but it gets worse. So the intended nationally determined contributions um, that were submitted by the governments of the world, um, if, they, if they do deliver on those um, uh, commitments to reduce, uh, to reduce emissions or hold emissions at certain levels, will essentially put us on a path, not to 1.5% rise, and by, we, by the way, we're pretty damn close to that already, uh, not on a path to two, and as I quite rightly pointed out, this is just a random political, uh, not a scientific uh, uh, target, it, not on a path to two, not on a path to three, but on a path to four or five or possibly worse when you take in the feedback mechanisms that scientists are still struggling to understand and they seem to be changing uh, so rapidly. So essentially, Paris has put us on a path to catastrophic climate change if the agreement is, is maintained as it is at this moment. Well, that's not a breakthrough for, for mankind. And the Hansen quote, James Hansen quote that I always use, in, for those of us who live in this, in, in this part of the world, in the northern climes, and we do have to do this, I think, we have to be patiently explained, but I think it's getting, it's getting through, just because the weather isn't hot here, just because we've got a miserable another July day that doesn't feel like a July day, doesn't mean that global temperatures aren't increasing, um, and it doesn't mean that a rise in temperatures isn't a, a problem, it's not the kind of, you know, Amber Rudd style, uh, oh, we might get some benefit from this, you know, it might be growing grapes uh, like the Romans did on the southern climes, they have said this, you know, um, it's not like that. We see the reality in terms of catastrophic climate change, and we no, haven't seen anything yet in terms of the reality of extreme, of, extreme, of extreme weather. There's no timeline. Paris is an absolute uh, disaster. So meanwhile, what's happening to the climate? Now, Asad's already spoken um, uh, about a great, a great deal of that. I just want to pick up on, on a couple of things. Um, I think... <laughs> I do think the reality is that because people are seeing that more visible everyday experience of extreme weather events, um, for us in the UK, it looks like the flooding, you know, that we now seem to be experiencing, well, we are experiencing, not seem to be, we are experiencing on a regular basis. There's an understanding that climate change is not a benign thing. It doesn't just make us live in a kind of Mediterranean, we're on holiday all the time type thing. It's leading to some catastrophic impacts on people's lives, even in the richest parts of the world. And by the way, we do live in one of the richest parts of the world, but look what happens when we face extreme weather events. We, it doesn't cope. You know, the infrastructure is divided along class lines with the rich looking after themselves. Cameron says no expense spared, and yet people are still struggling to get their homes back into the shape that they were before the floods, before the floods came along. I just want to pick up on the wildfires question, because many of us will be a little bit familiar with, you know, the kind of impacts on climate change. I just want to throw this one in. 2015 was a record wild, uh, year for wildfires. Um, uh, sorry, in Alaska and, and wilder than that. I think it's come home to us when we see the wildfires fires in Alberta, in Canada, and the irony of that in the tar sands, in the tar sands region that you've got a wildfire. But what scientists are actually also saying now is that wildfires that are happening, spreading across some of the richest parts of the world, are also now increasingly going to be drivers of, of climate change. So we've got in again those surprises that keep that keep coming on, but the devastation of those wildfires, like I say, in, in some of the richest parts of the world, which is not to, to neglect the poorest parts of the world, I'm just trying to illustrate that the idea that the richest parts of the world are immune from this, it isn't. Um, uh, better placed potentially to cope, uh, but even that it's 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 it's, it's a shimmer. It's not a it's not a it's not a reality, um, and the records uh, keep keep falling. Um, and as I'd mentioned, a whole a whole a whole number of them: uh, scorching temperatures, 51 degrees in India, uh, record warm autumn in Australia, um, uh, and we've got 2016 on track to be the hottest year on record, beating previous hottest. 2015, which in itself beat 2014 as a previous hotted. The run is unprecedented, including, uh, one sec, um, including uh, 16 of 17 of the warmest years on record since 2000. Now, I actually do feel we have to have these discussions. I, I'm, I, I'm not for moralising, but I am for discussing the reality with ordinary people, with working class people in our trade union branches. I'm for going through what is actually happening to our climate, how serious it is, and it's not about moralising. It's about why should we have this knowledge and then not share it with the people who have the potential to change, to change the world. So I am for, for that kind of debate on that kind of level uh, happening in as many places as possible. 
Um, Professor Michael Munn says this, this is what's happening now, the impacts of human-caused climate change are no longer subtle, they're playing out in real time before us. They serve as a constant reminder now of how critical it is that we engage in the actions necessary to avert ever more dangerous and potentially irreversible warming of the planet. So, what is happening on that front? Well, we have got a growing movement, absolutely. Um, Naomi Klein's book, you know, This Changes Everything, brilliant book, absolutely fantastic. The trouble is, it doesn't change everything. Um, we still have our battles to face in the current social and economic structures that shape how we're able to fight and the potential uh, for success uh, for success or failure. Um, the existing social and political structures and the conflicts within society are what shape the climate conflict as well as all other conflicts. And I think that's really important for us to understand. Unfortunately... It, Climate doesn't trump other things in the sense that people are living their everyday lives. They will be fighting um, for their, for their, for their, uh, against academization. They will be fighting uh, against the, the privatization of the, the, the NHS and all of those kind of things. We have to locate our struggles within that wider social battle and, and, and see ourselves on one side or other of that wider, of that wider social battle for, say, uh, for change and see ourselves allying with one side of that movement versus the other side uh, of that movement. So I want to try and finish on, on this. If that is the case, then let's just go back to Britain. There is that, that really incredibly important global movement that we're part of. But just for a minute, I just want to talk about Britain. If that is the case, if the battles play themselves out along those broad uh, uh, lines of the broader social struggles that are, that are taking place and what is happening in Britain at this moment in time, then we are up against a Tory, uh, we are up against a Tory government that has taken us backwards on climate change from the moment well actually while it was part of the coalition and then the moment it was elected as a, as a Tory government they unravel any single progressive policy that has taken place and the worst thing is that they do it whilst doing exactly what they've tried to do in the referendum, present their arguments as though they're doing this for work people. They have said that renewable energy is a waste of time because it puts money on our energy bills and that's why we've got to go with fracking, that's why we've got to go with fossil fuels. It's an absolute lie. Whilst they also at the same time minimise the impacts of climate change on ordinary working people. So they present it as a battle between the environmentalists and hard-working families. Hard-working families want their, their bills put down and they want their, their jobs in their local, local community, whereas these environmentalists don't care about any of those things. You know, They're too busy worrying about their own lifestyles and, and moralizing with people and whatever so go with the you know go with the government government strategies so we really have to fight very hard to unravel that kind of narrative um the Tories were disunited over the European referendum, but you bet your bottom dollar they have not been disunited over pushing the fossil fuel industry. Um, they have not been disunited over unravelling policies that allow us to tackle climate change. And no matter what the outcome is of the EU referendum, they will stay united in pushing forward fracking, pushing forward fossil fuels, putting our money subsidies into the fossil fuel industry in Hinkley Point and all, all of the rest of it. Whilst, meanwhile, our bills go up, while po fuel poverty... Um, increases and by the way jobs are not delivered into local communities communities are still left you know to, to rot and to and to die and to disappear in the way that we've seen many people express their feelings around around the european european referendum so we need an environmental movement that does not accept uh, that narrative that says that we know who we need to unite with we need to not unite with those people who are standing up against the system um, that is challenging uh, big business and the fossil fuel industry uh, we need to say that that's not the alternative Alternative between the environment and jobs. Actually, there are other alternatives, such as one million, uh, one million climate jobs. And we need to stand with those people who are defending a fight against that kind of system. People like Jeremy Corbyn, uh, you know, who at one meeting did hold a one, who, but also represent something. They represent saying no to that as a, as a way of, of organising society and all that goes with it, both for the people that live on the planet and for the planet itself. So a lot to play for, a lot of important things to do, um, but we've also got a lot of strengths on our side as well. Our next speaker is Tina Rothery, and Tina is an anti-fracking campaigner. And I always like to add to that bit, and a grandmother, because we started a group called the Nanas, even though we've been fighting fracking since 2011. We started a group in 2014 called the Nanas. And one of the reasons we did that was that I noticed every time we did media, it would say something like environmental campaigner, eco-warrior, and all these things. And I thought, A, I feel a bit of a fraud. I've never been that good. And B, 
how can you relate to me at home if you think that I'm doing something that you're not really paying attention to? And I needed people to understand that I was doing it because I was a grandmother and I was concerned for the next couple of generations. And then I noticed that every time we appeared on media, it was fabulous because it would say Tina Rothery Nana. And finally, people got the why rather than the what, which seemed important. And I keep hoping that one day I'm going to get to write a blog and it will be titled How Fracking Saved the World. Because... When fracking came to the UK in 2011, and they did uh, just one frack job so far, and that was up in Blackpool, and it led to two um, earthquakes and about 50 light seismic events, which got our attention, because I live in Blackpool, and we didn't even know this had happened. Um, so... When that happened, it got our attention, and then we had to react. But we had to react as a local residence. And we felt the need to alert the rest of the country that this is coming to you too, because it's 65% of the country is up for licensing. So as a movement, we were about three groups strong in the whole country in 2011, and we're now nearly 500 groups strong now. And the difference between what we do as building a movement and what people like um, you know, the environmental movement and things have had to be challenged by that we haven't is things like media for instance and we noticed this the other day is forever you have been countered and misled by the media that every time you say something they'll counter it or they'll divide people in and then there was the argument about is climate warming really happening and the division in that with fracking, it was such a simple thing that when we started doing public meetings, and we've now done hundreds, we never mentioned environment or climate because sometimes that scares people or sometimes their interpretation of the words and terminology we use divides an audience. So we would go and simply say, right here, your air and water is at risk and this will impact your children's health. You need to react. And that was how the groups formed. And then we didn't tell them how to do that. Because in the early days, we thought, should we maintain control? But then we realized it was just like too big. We po couldn't possibly maintain control. No one knew where central office was. There wasn't one. So um, we just kind of left people. But then you'd go back to groups later and you'd find that each one had operated on its own identity. One group where we are in a wealthy area had spent a lot of money on experts and lawyers and reports. But the benefit was for the whole community because then that became available to the rest of us. For other groups, Martin Moss, for instance, and Balkan, we set up camps, we slowed trucks, and we didn't really just slow trucks to slow the traffic and deter the movement, uh, to de deter the industry. What we would read the next day in the press would be, UK public shale gas opposition deters investors. And we realise we don't really live in a democracy, that's a myth because no one's really got a voice and we can't stop our government from taking these risks with us but what we can do is stop the supply chain to this industry and what they need more than anything is money and so if we can deter them but the uh, obviously and, and it's different here this is my first Marxism conference by the way thank you very much my head is so full like a burst uh, two days I, just, oh, <laughs> I need to get it all out um, but see, catching different perspectives is so important. But you see, you're all clued up. You're paying attention. You're looking. But we do areas where they've never looked. I mean, I, I think about Balkham a lot as the best example, which was when we first got there, beautiful village, um, probably quite a few conservative voters and certainly telegraph readers. And they didn't think they needed a camp and they didn't think they needed any help. And they assured us that they would approach their MP, Francis Maud, who employed... George, uh, Lord Brown into his first role in government and appointed him to the Department of Energy and Climate Change and he was the head of the fracking company um, and that Francis Maud would sort it out for them. They'd voted, they'd paid their taxes, they felt that they had this right to demand their democracy work for them and that didn't work and then they thought well their councillor surely won't pass the planning because why would he in their town except that it was his brother's land so that got through and uh, so then the camp was suddenly quite welcome then and then we had 150 people from a choir in the village come down the hill singing with new words to Jerusalem and making us welcome and then the next day in the sun I think it was and it somehow trickled into the telegraph as well it was um Activists tear apart beautiful village and defecate in driveways. <laughs> and a nice picture of a piece of poo, which none of us did because we used bathrooms. And uh, <laughs> I was sitting in the tea shop having scones with a nice lady at the time we read this. And all of these people are looking out of their curtains and thinking, they seem like nice people who care. 
Why is my press lying to me? So they've just discovered they've not got a democracy, their council has sold out, and now their media's lying. And then I watched this town probably have a small nervous breakdown and certainly get divided and torn apart. Because then you had to ask yourself, what was truth ever? When did they ever tell me the truth? When my media said to me, believe this, and I believed it, but now I can see you're blatantly lying. So for in a world outside of a Marxism conference and Friends of the Earth and climate campaigning and the things that we deal with, there is a whole world of people that we desperately need on board who don't speak our language. So we have to speak theirs. So we have to take ourselves to the easiest way to get them in. Because I don't worry. I called it the unwelcome gift once because I went to, uh, we were in the appeal the other uh, few weeks ago. And uh, this is where we won in Lancashire. We stopped the frackers. And they haven't fracked again, by the way. <laughs> Five years down the line, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and they promised full production by 2013. It's now 2016, and they've still only done the one. So no matter what they say, it's just bull. They still haven't done it. But um, I don't know where I was going now. I've lost that point. <laughs> so... Uh, to, to oh yeah, reaching out to regular communities, and but getting them on board was fairly easy once you worked out the wording to say to them, your health, your children's health, and it's not being a NIMBY, and if it is, what's wrong with that? Where do the children play? They play in the backyard, and this is not a choice. You know, someone, I'm in court at the moment over all sorts of hoo-ha with the company, with um, Quadrilla, and someone said, well, you know, why don't you just, you know, walk away? I'm like, how can you walk away? This is not a choice or a lifestyle choice. This is an obligation. I have a child and she has a child, and therefore I feel obliged, not just because, I mean, I say mine, but obviously for every child, but you are obliged by, by your existence to, you know, care about the future and to care for future generations. And so what I would ask of the people here is that we're clued up, but maybe remember that when you speak to other people um, and we try to get our viewpoints across, that it's not a matter of making them understand where we're coming from. It's just a matter of helping them to understand the threat that's coming and then leaving them to decide. Because when I called it the unwelcome gift, we called it that because when I went to the appeal, there were 70 people waiting to speak um, and put their case forward from our side. And I recognized every face. And I recognized every face from their first meeting, and I wanted to cry because, yeah, it's great you're there, but they all look much older, really old now. <laughs> we all look old and tired. But I also realized one benefit was that before they were all neighbors, and now I was looking at a community. And that was the beauty of the anti-fracking movement. And we also have the gift of starting when we already had social media and independent media. We have a site called Drill or Drop, independent journalist, thorough. Not anti-fracking, but it accidentally looks that way because she tells the truth. And so when the Mirror approached me the other day to write something, I said, just see Drill or Drop. Because we've already written the story. You know, don't try and put a spin on it. We've already got it laid in stone. So I think we're quite fortunate in this movement. And it would be really good to you maybe when your areas can look out for your local anti-fracking group, and there will be one. Because I think actually we're nearly 500 groups now, aren't we? Um, so, yeah. Oh, and by the, the Nana thing. Yes, that, that works well too. We've we take tea and cake and we smile at meetings and at roadsides instead of angry banners we have honk support we smile and we wave a lot because no one wants to talk to you if you've got an angry banner and an angry face no one's talking to you but i do remind people though that in the end we're cute we're fluffy and we're sweet but we're protecting our young and you don't mess with people who are protecting the young thank you Okay, we're going to open up uh, for questions, discussion, uh, contributions now. Um, I'm going to ask um, people to just raise their hands if they'd like to speak. Um, you'll have three minutes and I'll tap on the mic on the table um, uh, when I'd like you to sum up. So if we could have, um, yeah, in the hat at the back, yep, first up. I'll take people uh, sort of two at a time and then at the front as well. I want to, well actually what I first want to do is pay tribute a little bit to Tina, because actually Tina is on the front line of a very, very important battle 
And you can always, if you want to know the problem in society, follow the money. And when they're trying to get £55,000 out of a single campaigner, you know that's because there is a real crucial political issue going on. And I think it's brilliant that Tina's here, but I also think it's more important that what Tina has done in terms of building and strengthening a wider movement. And I want to talk a little bit about how we can build that movement further. And I want to do it by talking about fracking uh, in the first instance. But I think this could be extended to a whole number of issues around the question of environment and climate change in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in general. And that's about the stuff that Tina's talking about. It's how do you approach working class people and involve them in an issue that can actually be quite abstract in one sense. You know, climate change is portrayed as something that happens to people in far off countries and, uh, and the rest of it. And I think that's really, in the fracking movement, that's actually something that's actually quite straightforward. Because what the fracking industry offers and what their politicians offer is a, an alternate vision. They say to the population of Lancashire, we're going to bring thousands of jobs. We have to turn around and say, look, it's not true. The Quadrilla uh, 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 a company that's fracking in Blackpool talked about the average number of jobs coming to, for each well as being 22. That's not hundreds of jobs, that's not a thousand jobs. And then they go further and they say, actually, the jobs you're going to get locally are going to be the security jobs. They're going to be the people making the sandwiches. They're not going to be the highly paid technological jobs. And that's where we have to turn around and say there's an alternate vision. There's a different way of, uh, of getting energy that isn't about destroying the planet and is actually much, much better for the environment. So I, was, I agree with Tina. I was very struck in the Salford campaign in Barton Moss around fracking how it never started around climate change. It started about people being concerned about things like the number of lorries coming down their street, or the impact on house prices, or the pollution from traffic and, uh, and so on. Things that impacted on them as a people and their, and their community and their, and their family. And the job, really, for the left... And, and the movement is to take that and generalise and generalise from it and to show how all those issues are linked and as part of things. And we did it very successfully in Salford. I'm very proud of the role that the Campaign Against Climate Change played in terms of bringing together the trade union movement from, uh, from Salford with the anti-fracking activists and the local community into a force that was incredibly powerful. They packed those drills up, they went away and they never came back and they lost all the cases in the court where they tried to take people to prison for it. The final thing what I want to say is this is not an abstract question you see this is coming to a community near you 60 percent of the uk has the potential to be fracked uh, 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 if you follow the uh, uh, the thing the boland shale that is the uh, the shale that me and uh, and tina have had to campaign again is under some of the most highly population density cities in the country uh, as well as some of the most environmentally sensitive areas this is coming to a group a community near near you and actually i think we need to be part and parcel of those movements to shape them to turn them oh, not just into against the local fracking but into a movement that says actually we don't like what you are doing about the planet and we don't like the way you're doing it and we want something better for our children and our futures and for, the, uh, for, for society as a whole. Um, I'd just like to start in the same way. Tina, I've never met you before but uh, you have my utmost heartfelt respect for everything you've done um, I know what it's like to go through what you've gone through but I didn't go through it alone so to face 55,000 pounds worth of costs for the so-called eviction of the camp is not only outrageous it's a testament to your strength that you are saying that you won't pay and the reason I know what you're going through is that um, I'm part of a local group uh, that used to be called Save Leighton Marsh is now called Save Lee Marshes and we started off trying to oppose a temporary basketball training facility for the Olympics on our common land now what actually happened was that land which is common land was also contaminated land because it was used as landfill after the Second World War. Now, despite that fact, it was excavated and tons of contaminated material were excavated to put up this 11 metre high structure, which cost the taxpayer millions of pounds, but then was dismantled again. And we tried to stop this facility going ahead in a similar way to you, and we tried to stop vehicles coming down the footpath uh, with our bodies, and we ended up having an Occupy camp come to Leighton Marsh and support our campaign. Now, we faced the same repression that you are facing, and we took out a judicial review, and as that failed, 
as well as going to the High Court, uh, we faced a bill of about £25,000. And if we appealed and we lost, it could have gone up to £75,000. And we gave in and we had to give the Olympic Delivery Authority, which had millions of pounds of taxpayers' money for its legal bill alone, it had billions of pounds of public money, we had to give them thousands of pounds from our own public campaign and we very much regret that we gave in to them so please stay strong the second thing I'd like to say is that whenever I come to a talk like this and whenever I look at the news and I look at the issue of climate change it seems very abstract and it's devastating what's happening but the way to stop that hopelessness and that devastation is to act in your local community not every local community is going to be fracked, but every local community has a, tr uh, a forest, a cemetery, a local green space that is under attack from development or from corporate power. And when it's under attack, we must get together and we must save those green spaces and those forests, and not just for humans, but for all the wildlife. We are in a symbiotic relationship with our wildlife, and if they go, we go. A good example is the bees. If they go, they take 80% of our fruit and vegetables with them. We cannot afford to lose our wildlife. We cannot afford to lose our green spaces. And we must think global, understand the abstract, but act wherever we are and don't give in and be like Tina. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to thank all the speakers as well. I want to start like them from Paris and the Paris Agreement because actually if we're serious about reducing emissions, what it means is breaking from fossil fuels, leave them in the ground. And actually, as I understand it, I think I'm right, in the agreement that came out in Paris, I don't think coal and oil are mentioned. I think renewables were mentioned once, although renewables actually could be, you know, uh, power all our energy needs if we made that investment. I think that aviation and shipping, which are massive uh, contributors to emissions, were not mentioned either. And actually, it's quite interesting about um, uh, shipping, because actually, as we're in a globalised system and globalised production... A lot of people often say, oh, it's all China's fault. Well, actually, it's a lot of Western multinationals that have outsourced their manufacturing to places like China, and then it gets imported back to the US or the UK. And let's be clear, this isn't about blaming Western consumers. These are about blaming the multinationals who want to squeeze more money out and go for the cheapest place to try and produce. But the emissions in all the um, shipping are not even counted in anyone's um, emissions, any countries. Actually, they're equivalent to the seventh largest country, if you actually were going to count it in terms of what it does. So these are big problems with that agreement. But you see, the other side of Paris was actually the movement itself. I mean, we were all actually in Paris. We all met up, I think, everyone on the panel in different ways. And it was an amazing. Actually, it was quite amazing because we got to march, even though there was a state ban. And at the same time in Britain, the week before, there'd been the biggest climate demonstration ever. It was actually for climate uh, jobs and justice. It combined all the different things, 70,000 people. And actually, I think that what has marked the environmental movement has been a real generalisation about the system. People want to talk, like Assad did, about actually racism, about refugees, about those issues. They want to talk about housing. They want to talk about war. They want to talk about class, about how these things impact um, unequally on people. And that, to me, is a good thing because it starts a discussion about capitalism and how fossil fuels are embedded in capitalism, but also about how you can draw wider groups of people about how you bring about change. And I want to finish on at the moment. You see, to me... It seems like a time when our movement should be pushing forward its advantage. The Tories really are in a crisis at the moment. There is no smooth transition going on to their new leads. They're all busy stabbing themselves in the backs. This is a good time. It's a testament to the movement there's only been one frack, but they want to continue. But this is the time to fight, isn't it? And I mean, hopefully people in the audience are going to talk about it. But there's a big um, movement going on in Rydale in Yorkshire and a big demonstration planned for the 30th of July. I'm sure you're going to talk about it. But actually, we should be getting there. The bigger that is, the better. But it is, it's not only in the local well by well. We have to take it to the government as well, centrally, don't we? And it seems to me a very good place to go is the 2nd of October, Tory party conference in Birmingham, to actually bring a massive climate block to be part of that and make it very big that wherever we are by the autumn, because who knows, they're in such a way we want to stick the boot in to them over these policies and everything else the Tories are trying to do. Next, we'll be in the purple t-shirt, yes. 
Yeah, John Parrington, Oxford. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on this subject of what technology can do. Can technology reverse global warming? Can it offset the, the effects of global warming? Because we sometimes hear you know, stories in the newspapers. There was something a, a couple of weeks ago about revolutionary new technique for turning ca- ca- putting carbon dioxide into rocks. And it sounds very good. Or you can just drain all the excess carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere problem solved. Uh, I, I think there's, there's other things that could be done. One of the biggest impacts, I think, of, of global warming in the, in the initial term is going to be on uh, foodstuffs, on agriculture. I mean, there's, there's already, uh, we're starting to see signs that the, the, the green revolution that has basically fed the planet for the last you know, 50 years or so is, is, is grinding to a halt. It's actually reversing the yields of, 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 of wheat and rice are going down because of the effects of global warming and particularly this kind of whiplash weather where you get extreme cold or then extreme um, uh, heat is, is, is wreaking havoc on, 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 on plants. Um, so the idea is maybe by genetically engineering uh, plants and animals Animals, you could somehow offset this, but I think this all oh, th- this forgets first of all that this isn't just some gradual kind of linear thing that's happening in global warming. It's ac- it's potentially going to accelerate very fast. You know, as, as the as the Antarctic starts to melt, that, that actually brings further changes. The big biggest it, if, you know affects the whole the, the oceans, the, the, the levels of the oceans, all sorts of things. It, it can rapidly kind of accelerate. And, and secondly, I think also the misconception that technology alone can help us. It's it's the assumption that capitalism is a rational system. Actually, there are capitalists out there. Uh, the richest man in the world, Bill Gates, who's made some very good critiques of, 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 the, of the state of affairs. He said that basically we need to do something radically and the free market is incapable of doing it. The problem is capitalism is an anarchic system. It doesn't work in a rational way. So it's so... It's so inspiring, actually, to listen to what Tina said about you know using the sort of local campaign to make link up with the much bigger questions. And I think also just to end, really, we should also remember this is happening in, in other countries as well. Actually, one of the biggest impacts, probably, of, 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 of uh, problems in, in food supplies and the rest of it is going to be on places like Egypt. We, we, we're so used to hearing about you know refugees as being a problem, uh, all the racing that goes with it. We shouldn't forget that you know somewhere like Egypt, the revolution there showed a completely different way, way in which things could go. Uh, and although it's been pushed back for now, the potential is massive. We shouldn't also forget that things like the French Revolution started because people were starving to death because of, of problems in the, in, in the food supply. So I think all these things will help connect together um, the, 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 the different movements. But we need to have this vision of a social society that can use technology, but only in a, only, the only side that can use it in a rational way, not just to stop global warming, but, but, but to, to, to bring about a completely different society that everybody can benefit from. Yes, yeah, yeah. And then the comment from her. Every time I speak, I get incredibly nervous and to think if I can get it out in three minutes uh, in a coherent fashion. I'm a Dutch comrade and I just finished an article yesterday on a blockade action that we did last week in the second largest coal port of Europe. We shouldn't underestimate the small countries. The, the small country of the Netherlands with a population of 16 million has the two largest coal ports in Europe. And we blocked it for 10 hours last week on Friday. Um, it just shows you that um, I never got involved in a direct action like that. I was actually in the legal section. We had three sections. One, pe- uh, one group of people up in the crane, uh, One group of people down at the crane stopping the police from getting in and they actually need special police to take people out and take off the lock-ons. And we were standing outside being um, a point of attention for people who want to join in the action, a point of accessibility that it should be able, that all people should be able to join in the action, even though we we were in a remote area. And we got the media, uh, we received the media, and there were people twittering from inside. And that was the day after the Brexit. And in the Netherlands, the Brexit was hashtag number one, but we were hashtag number two. Yay! Yay. (laughs) Um, And we don't really have local networks. We do have uh, people who organize against shale gas. But there were actually four uh, places, uh, three coal plants, and one, oh, the, the coal port. Okay, this is the part where it gets dicey and I hope to stay quick and coherent. Uh, four places, one up in the north where there is a lot of gas. We have a, a large gas reserve, but we have a natural 
uh, habitat that's actually um, been uh, declared part of World Heritage shortly, and our uh, one of our national ministers. Our, one of our ministers wants to go ahead and drill for gas in that same area because he says all the permits have been lent. And even the opposition in our parliament are saying, what the hell are you talking about? Stop this shit. <laughs> uh, and he's going ahead anyway, so we actually need a good climate movement. And we were inspired by Ende Gelende. Around 150 people uh, from the Netherlands joined in the Ende Gelende action. We'd never really done direct actions like this before. So it just shows you that the international aspect of things done locally, while well, we're international activists, but I'm really inspired by the stories that happen here, like how to get your local communities involved and to talk the language of people, of the people who are living there, are saying that this will affect your children, your grandchildren, etc. I just want to finish on the fact that after doing some research, it turned out that there were three new coal plants built for six, uh, built, uh, for six billion euros uh, this year, a couple of months ago, and in these three months that they were opened, they already um, devalued by half. Because renewable energy is on the rise and the director of the coal plants is panicking and asking the German government to intervene. So the, politi the choice to go over to renewable is, is really political, not a practical one. We can just start doing renewables now like they did in Germany, stopping it for three, four days, going to 100% new renewable. Uh, hi, Tim from Norwich. Just wanted to make a quick first three points. The first one is about the system capitalism in terms of technology can, could respond to this. Uh, I had a meeting in Norwich about climate change and a, someone from the SWP who's an economist said, well, actually, if you think about the Second World War, factories shifted making cars, etc., to making tanks in three months, two months. In the Soviet Union, it's, which is not good at Stalinist, but workers moved whole factories from across continents in order to deal with the crisis but by the time we get to the point where it is a massive crisis and they know what's coming they know it's happening it's too late so I think we have to start that actually we can deal with this crisis the second thing the uh, comrade from Africa who talked about that social justice has to be central to the, cam the campaign of, about dealing with climate change I think is really really important you have to understand in terms of working class people today I think the, the I think something has changed. People, a lot of people won't understand that climate change is happening, particularly younger working class people understand. The question is, what do you do about it? Because if you can't stop the Tories uh, from attacking our public services, if you can't stop uh, the way the situation in the workplace is, how the hell can you <laughs> deal with this massive issue of climate change? The question of bringing down the Tories and ending austerity in Europe and across the world is intimately linked with the question of dealing with cli climate change. That's essential. We, so into, and the other thing is about agitating about th these issues are going to come home to our shores very more f f sooner rather than later. We did, um, after having a lot of debate after the floods in Norwich, we did a bit of research into uh, the funding for defences in Norfolk, which is a very low-lying area, and we found out that UKIP and the Tories in particular and Labour have all cut the budget for sea defence repeatedly over the decades. Um, Norfolk is going to get hit if sea levels rise and sea levels are going to rise. And the first places that are going to get hit are the poorest places and not the richer areas that are more defended. Yep. It's places like Great Yarmouth, which is very, very uh, precarious. It's surrounded. It's a bit like New Orleans. They particularly cut the f defence budget. So if, we, if we're trying to link, it's not just fracking. If there are, if there are floods in Norfolk, then as socialists, we have to be, work with the trade unionists and get out and call marches about why have you cut the defences and then link that with the wider issue of climate change as a whole. That's essential. It's essential to link the movement against austerity with climate change because, and I just had a quick question, Fortress Europe, is this also a preparation for the barbarism of the future, of locking people out because they know... They don't care, do they? They know it's coming. They know they're destroying the planet. Are they preparing in advance for the massive refugee crisis that will be caused 
by climate change, and we have to do something. Socialism or barbarism, comrades. <laughs> Um, I really want, actually, fortuitously, to um, to sort of pick up where the last comrade um, sort of finished off. I think it was in Naomi Klein's book that she said every fight against austerity is part of the fight against um, fight against climate change. Um, but that's not automatic. I think that that's no more automatic than um, saying a fight against austerity is, is automatically a fight against racism. You know, you have to be very specific in the way that you go out and argue against racism, the, the fact that it divides us, etc., and at the same time build a movement against austerity. And I think it's, the, uh, it, it's very similar in the climate change movement and, uh, and, and also the corner of it. The only corner of it I know anything about is fracking. I mean, the only reason I'm standing here is because um, I I'm an, uh, come from a community that is under threat. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the links I think we can make as we, um, as we build that movement. Um, th there's no government at the moment, effectively, to, you know, to impose anything as far as I can see. Um, we, you know, we're in, a, obviously, a massive situation of flux. And as, we, um, as, as we've talked about at this conference, try and shape that, part of that shaping of that, I think, has got to be, be bringing these environmental voices in, into, uh, it, you know, into all of our marching against the government. I hear already that they're kind of backing down on the third runway because whoever's going to replace them is, is not going to be strong enough to implement that. And then we can push back also against uh, things like fracking. Sorry to keep mentioning fracking, but I do think, right? I, re I, really, I really think that fracking is one of the sharp focuses of climate change in Britain today. What Tina was talking about when she was saying that you have to, uh, you have to speak the language of the community, I've sort of got a different metaphor. It's, it's like a, 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 you know, a bird that fishes going down into the local community and, and answering the concerns of those local community campaigns. We can't go into a community and tell them what they should be thinking. We have to start stand side by side with them um, and, and start to answer those concerns and from there you'll find that you can build links. You can build links with social justice because they've changed the definition of fracking so that they can get away with it. They introduce a fast type fast tack um, time frame, they overturn moratoriums, they ignore a 99.2% um, uh, mandate to, to oppose fracking. So, you know, we can make these links. The links between climate change and refugees is not just at the level of climate change, it's also because Nanashire has no borders, so there's a, a really obvious link there. And uh, the first thing you can do is come to the march on the 30th of July in York. Details to be announced. Thank you. Um, I actually wanted to say something about Game of Thrones, which some people I'm sure can't stand, but I think it's become one of the most giant cultural products of our decade, in part because it expresses something that people feel, I think, about climate change. I mean, everything that takes place in Game of Thrones, for those who don't know, is in the shadow of an impending catastrophe. Winter is coming, is one of the taglines. Everything is going to be covered in snow. There is going to be no food, and ice zombies are going to kill everyone. And yet, <laughs> this is almost completely absent from the stage of what's going on. The ruling elites aren't doing anything about this. They're fighting with each other. Their rivalry with each other bogs them down entirely. And in the process, they ruin everything that could face up to that threat. And I think that's actually how it feels a lot with climate change, isn't it? It's not that people aren't aware of it, and it's not that people aren't worried about it, but it seems so far away from anything that our rulers are actually doing. The things they do seem so absurdly disconnected and in denial about it. And I think for when we respond to people with what, what can solve climate change, we need something that's as radical as the threat that's coming, that's as, as big as able to rise that, that, to go back to Game of Thrones, involves saying it is possible to get rid of these idiots who are on the Iron Throne and, and, and around it and to have something else. Because I think it's not really possible for things that are sure of that level of radicalism to connect with the scale of, 
of the threat. You know, uh, people are offered opportunities to applaud what's being done at, uh, at places like Paris, which, as all the speakers have said, has been useless, or to change their light bulbs and recycle more. It's meaningless. And I think Tim is absolutely right to mention Fortress Europe and the, the immigration controls and barriers that are being put up. There is going to be a radically right wing response that will increasingly be put that says the more the world is under threat, the more the world is unstable, the more our resources become scarcer, the more we need to fight to keep them ours and away from someone else. And I think the only way that we can stop that going to the right is by getting something that um, that is up to the task that shows another society um, is possible, that a defeat for the ruling class is possible. And just finally, as a, a, a side point, but I think it's very positive that the decision on Heathrow Airport that was due to come through in the past week has now been kicked under the long grass for the second time actually because of the rivalries in the Tory party over it where they all desperately want a new runway for London they all desperately don't want it in their constituencies and their divisions you know can cause big problems for them we, we need to take advantage of on the discussion this will be our, our last speaker sorry if you indicated and I do get a chance to call Hi, I'm Judy Pascal from uh, the Campaign Against Climate Change and Frat Free Greater Manchester. Um, I just wanted to uh, kind of reiterate the point, firstly, that this is a jolly good time to fight because they're so blimmin' badly organised, as we keep saying, they've got no time for anything except stabbing themselves in, and each other in the back. Um, and, uh, you know, Labour's in a pretty bad way as well, although I think a lot of us will be doing what we can to support Corbyn, not least because uh, he's been photographed uh, waving the Million Climate Jobs booklet and has a good line on climate jobs and, and on fracking. Um, so, yes, and it was particularly good the day after the referendum result came out. Um, well, the day it came out, I actually voted Remain and I was very depressed. <laughs> Um, uh, but to be up in, uh, in Blackpool supporting Tina when she went for a hearing to do with the £55,000 of costs, that really made us all feel a lot better because we were doing something. And I looked around and I thought, well, we've got 150 people there at 9 o'clock mor on a weekday morning uh, in Blackpool, which is not the easiest, the most central place to, to get to. And we'd managed to organise ourselves to do that. So, you know, we can take heart that we are much better organised uh, than, than either of the, you know, the parties which are squabbling at the moment. And um, that's mainly because we believe in what we're fighting for. You know, we're, not, uh, we're not talking out of one side of our mouth and doing something else. Um, just something on um, climate change, the climate change argument in the fracking, up, in, in the fracking campaign. Um, I found early on that people didn't, to my mind, mention climate change enough. I found myself giving out a leaflet at Barton Moss uh, which didn't actually mention climate change and when I realised I was quite shocked with myself um, but uh, you know obviously we do our best to push that argument and it's getting much more widely recognised in the fracking, in the anti-fracking movement and uh, uh, I think it's being with things like the floods uh, it's becoming much more obvious that climate change is not something distant, it's something, uh, it's something Something that affects all of us and that was uh, brought home to me in Salford at a meeting about the floods Please. yes I, I will um, I just can I can I just wait one more point um, yes linking up campaigns uh, some young mothers who I didn't know at all called a protest about the uprising racism in my local precinct in Presswich um, and we all went along and I was able to tell them about the fracking thing and they're all going to be coming along uh, to Berrytown Hall on the 13th of July uh, to, uh, to lobby the council who are having a debate on fracking that day and we'll be able then I think to put a lot of the arguments about the links between the migrant issue and, uh, uh, and uh, apart from the fact of course we welcome migrants but the other thing is the very close link with climate change. Thank you. Thanks, 
uh, to uh, all our contributors. Sorry if you put your hand up and I, and I didn't have um, a chance uh, to call you. Thank you um, very much. Um, before I bring our speakers back to sum up, um, they'll have about five minutes each. I've just got a few announcements. Um, bookmarks have a stall just outside the door um, with lots of books and pamphlets related to this meeting, including this pamphlet on Marxism and ecology. So please do go out, have a look at what they've got there and also visit the shop, which is just of the Institute of Education Bar. Um, on the table, just uh, to the side of the room here, um, One Million Climate Jobs pamphlet um, from the Campaign Against Climate Change is also available for people who would um, like to buy them. And finally, um, Suzanne has an uh, article in this uh, issue of the International Socialism Journal on uh, climate, social movements and Marxism. If you'd like to have a read of that, it's a back issue, so it's £2. Please do come up at the end. I've got a couple of copies here if you would um, like to have a read of those. Um, so I'm going to ask Assad to come back first of all. Thank you. Uh, so much to agree with. Um, first of all, let's all um, agree that climate change is too serious to be left to the environmentalists. Right? It is absolutely way too serious to be left to them. And it, of course, is the greatest crisis of neoliberalism of the market. And if you look at the neoliberals, what they say is, yeah, fingers crossed, maybe some technology is going to save us. And the technology that they're talking about, this, for example, carbon capture and storage, in terms of food impacts, for example, we use 1.5 billion hectares of land around the world to produce food. They need 6 billion hectares to be able to grow the bioenergy that they're talking about for carbon <coughs> capture and storage. And whose land will be taken, who people will be displaced, it will be the most marginalised, the most poorest and the most vulnerable people. So we know that actually when you need a strong state, the neoliberal project wants a small state. The moment you need regulation, they want deregulation. It's no surprise that the main people behind the Leave campaign, into Michael Gove, etc., are also great climate sceptics. Because when they talk about the EU regulations that they want to rip up, those are some of the EU regulations that they do want to rip up. They want to rip up the regulations regulations that regulate British uh, dirty energy industries. Now, we all know that that sense of the other is a fundamental part of the neoliberal project, the alienation of people. And we see that clearly in Fortress Europe. I say, if people are surprised at the fact, the fact that thousands of people are drowning now, in decades to come, Europe will be machine gunning people on the on the on the on the, at the, at the on the fences of Europe. And what is now happening? We're seeing people being forcibly removed from camps in Greece. We're seeing Macedonian police using tear gas and live bullets. We saw Turkey two weeks ago shoot eight Syrian refugees, four children, three women, and a man for what crime? For crossing the border. Why? Because the EU has a, an agreement with Syria. 3.5 billion taxpayer uh, euros handed over to Turkey. They've got the same agreement with now with Egypt. They're making an agreement with Somalia. They want the Europe's borders to put, be pushed, Europe to offset its own immigration to other countries. And the primary objective is to be able to stop people from migrating, of course. So we need to build a vibrant movement, a vibrant movement that includes all of our social justice movement. The fundamental problem we have is we don't have enough power. We have to accept that. And to build power, we have to talk about, yes, justice, but we have to talk about climate in a way that relates to people. The greatest I mean, I would like to bloody go back and shoot the people who decide that climate change was about polar bears. Climate change was never about polar bears. The moment you made it about polar bears, you alienated most people because, of course, it didn't relate to their existence in any way. What we've got to talk about is concrete people's demands. We've got to talk about energy. Yes, the front line is fracking, but you know what? We've also got to talk about our solutions. We've got to talk about community-owned energy systems. People-owned energy systems are responsible, an alternative to the big multinationals. We've got to to start talking about warm homes, a way of connecting with fuel poverty and energy poverty in our, in our country. We've got to start talking about the fact that $10 million per minute is handed over in direct and indirect subsidies to the dirty energy corporations around the world. And they talk about a lack of money. They talk about that there's no money to be able to, to hand out to, to help the poorest countries, but we can give 11 to 13 trillion to bail out the banks. We need to talk about the right to food, that everybody has the right to food all across the world. 
And that means changing our agri agricultural systems. It means changing and tackling the Monsantos, etc. Because their solution to this is, of course, more state-owned, I mean, more corporation-owned food systems. What they are saying is, of course, the alternative to the collapse of your food system is GM food that we will control. Seeds, killer seeds that, will, that you need to keep coming back to us as a company, that you need to come back to us in terms of fertiliser. That's why in India at the moment, a quarter of a million farmers have committed suicide because of the fact that they got into debt over uh, 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 these GM seeds. We need to talk about people, really put people at the centre. And that does mean solidarity about refugees. But it also means much more about that. We have to talk about air pollution. The fact that 40,000 people die in this country because of air pollution. The fact that if you live in the East End of London and, you live in, and the difference between your life expectancy in the East End and those rich leafy parts in Richmond is 10 years. And 10 years because of air pollution. Because the poorest, the most vulnerable black communities, all of us, we live where the most sources of dirty energy are and of course air pollution. And most fundamentally of all, we have to talk about just transition. We have to talk about real jobs. Not jobs which are casual, zero contract hours. We have to talk about building an economy that works for people and works for the planet. And that is the way that we actually start to build real concrete links with the trade union movement. I have to say I'm really proud that in the last year, Friends of the Earth, we've marched on the march against austerity and we've been on the march for refugee rights because we finally have started to make at least some section of the environment movement recognise that this is a fight we can only all win together. If you believe we can win it in piecemeal, piecemeal, we all lose. That's our job now. Progressive people, we have to build a movement, a movement with justice at its core. And I've got to say, the left hasn't taken climate change as seriously as it has, as it should do. And that's partly our job also, that we have to talk within our own movement, with our own thing, and make people understand that climate change is not an abstract issue, that climate change is a fundamental issue about global solidarity, about people on the front lines. Every week, three people somewhere in the world die because they're standing up to corporations. They're standing up to banks and big business. And a lot of those big business and big corporations, their headquarters are here in London. So we have to show our solidarity when people are resisting dirty energy around the world that we take action with them here in London and in the UK. Friends, we have only a limited amount of time, a limited amount of time to build a really progressive movement. In December, we all came together. We had that brilliant demonstration, a march for climate, for justice and for jobs. That has to be the foundation on which we continue to build and build and build until we defeat not only climate change, but we can actually build a planet that actually treats people with dignity and that is able to solve all of the other inequalities. Because I, without, as I said, without solving those inequalities, we actually fail on climate climate change as well. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, sort, of, sort of first of all thank Asad and, and Tina for coming to, to speak today. And I, um, Tina described her situation as having a bit of a hoo-ha with Cordrilla. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know clearly a whole number of people in the audience know what that hoo-ha is all about. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to just to spend one minute when you get out to speak, just telling us what that hoo-ha is all about um, and, and, and making sure that all of us are mobilising for you um, around that issue. Because, because essentially they, they are trying to criminalise Tina, they are trying to criminalise her and they're trying to criminalise the rest of the movement. They are trying to scare Tina and they're not managing to scare Tina. They hope that by doing that they will scare the rest of us and not of us will feel confident enough to stand up against their juggernaut. Well, she's held the line. We now have to make sure that we hold her back well and truly hold her back and come in behind her and give her as much possible support that we can. So she needs to tell us a little bit more about what we need to do and that we need to put our heads together and think about how can we take her case uh, forward and broaden it out uh, as wide as possible in terms of in terms of the movement. Um, I just want to mention about this this uh, question about uh, talking about climate change. And you know, I think I think Tina, when you said you know how do we reach out to how do we speak to people outside this room in many ways you're kind of you're speaking to the converted in on that issue you know socialists have always put the heart of what they want to do actually be to be able to debate with wide sections of people because there's a strong belief in our movement that real social change comes from the actions of ordinary people Karl Marx said the emancipation of the working class is the act of the working class not the act of a politician on your behalf 
behalf or some elite uh, that can somehow solve your problems. And when you see the kind of atmosphere um, that we've had in the last week, yes, it's been complicated and all of that kind of stuff, but one very simple thing has has sort of shone through in the last week. Ordinary people are capable of engaging with politics in an intense, deep, uh, deep way where their thoughts, their ideas, they matter to them, they want them listened to, they want to engage, it, engage in the debate. It worries me that some of the response of some people in the Remain camp is to misunderstand and somehow believe that the people who express their opinion, you know, haven't got ideas in their head. Yeah, they didn't think it through. They did it in an ignorant way. No, people thought things, thought things through. They just happened to make decisions that you might might disagree, but we have to keep those debates open. What it showed is the politicisation of society, uh, how easily that can happen, and how important it is that we engage with that debate. Um, now, on climate change, I do think we have to speak about climate change, um, because our enemies are talking about it. Trust me, they are talking about our Daily Mail. Go to Daily Mail, on a daily basis, sorry, in the Daily Mail. You go to the, the Daily Mail search engine is a horrible thing. You put in a, any progressive word and it will churn out a load of articles um, saying this is terrible, it's bringing about the end of civilization, it's all the lefties this and the lefties that, whatever. Put in the word climate change and you get a load of nonsense gurged out on a daily basis about how it will damage the interests of working people if we tackle if we tackle climate change so they're talking about it we need to make sure that that is not their territory it has to be our territory we have to we have to articulate uh, the second thing is say i think the left I, I, I agree with assad's point and i want to just finish on that about you know le- we have to take this very seriously in the left but um the left the left in the past has always been willing to tackle complicated and complex issues and has always been willing to stick its neck out on the line when it comes to fighting racism in predominantly white working class communities. They are difficult discussions to have, but they need to be had and they have. When it comes to tackling sexism, they have been difficult discussions. So I want to see a situation, we do talk about climate change, we make it very concrete in the way that people in the way that people said. Our going backwards demonstration down Whitehall, which was, a, it was just so much fun, it was just so brilliantly, weirdly wonderful. Um, we walked backwards down Whitehall on a very, very, very hot day um, to illustrate that the government was going backwards on climate change. We did loads and stop off points talking about their policies and how they were taking how they were taking it backwards. And we started that by with some we had some big posters um, which said this is what going backwards on climate change looks like. And there were pictures of the flooding that had impacted and the dates, you know, one year, next year, whatever. So we have to make that concrete, yes, but we have to talk about climate change. And I want to see us do that in the fracking movement as 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 well. Next extreme weather event that takes place in the UK, I want to see feel like up and down the country in communities, in workplaces. Um, people are talking about the issue and the Daily Mail is not leading the, 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 the understanding of the situation. But you know, our understanding of the situation is there. Finishing up on, 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 on this, I thought Tim's point was incredibly important. If people feel that they can't fight back and save their local health service, they can't save back and save their local school, defend their job or whatever, then that lack of confidence about being able to bring social change, how do you then apply that to tackling climate change? So the things are connected incredibly. The progressive movement, full stop. Is it making progress or others being pushed back? Um, the second thing, I, I just want to make the point about cli- climate jobs. I've, I've read a number of kind of green critiques of, um, not green party, but green critiques of climate jobs, essentially suggesting that the, the climate jobs thing is essentially a Keynesian argument and it's pushing for more growth. You know, the expansion in climate jobs is essentially about pushing pushing growth and expanding expanding the economy in that way. It, that's, that's not what climate jobs is about. What climate jobs is saying is we need to reduce our emissions quickly and dramatically. Um, to do that, we need to invest in certain areas. Uh, we need to invest in renewable energy. We need to invest in transport. We need to invest in insulated in our homes, etc. By doing that, we create meaningful jobs which take action on climate change. We argue in that for a national climate service. That's not, you know, in other words, we're saying that can only be done if we start the process of proper regulation again. That we look at the problem and we attempt to meet um, the problem with a, with a solution, not negative technology. And then you think about what that looks like in these communities. Martin started off by saying what they're saying in the frack. You know, they turn up and they say Quadrilla is going to bring X number of jobs. It's all a lie. But if we can then combine that with, say, 
saying, that's a lie, that's 20, that's 20 jobs rather than 2,000 jobs, but here how we could, here's how we could create jobs in your local community, and the northeast is where I come from, the wind, <laughs> the wind, etc. This is how we could create jobs in your community, real jobs, etc. Final point I want to make is this, as I said, the left has got to take this seriously, I 100% agree with that, I think things are moving in a better direction, most, most definitely, but I just want to mention what, what Assad said, um, you know, we did come together around the climate justice and jobs demonstration in November. That was very contested because many people in the, in the climate movement did not want climate justice and jobs. But we did that and we had a brilliant open rally and a, a reasonably strong and diverse demonstration. I just like to make appeal that we need to keep coming back together. The progressive elements of the climate movement need to keep coming back together, need to keep talking about how can we take, how can we take it uh, forward, even if we don't have those easy stop-off points in terms of Paris or something like that. But I think we need to keep this debate going because this is far too much to lose and so much to win um, if we can bring that kind of politics to the direction of the movement. So yeah, not everybody really knew the story behind the court case. So in a nutshell, but for, before I say why, I didn't mention it because I really... I know, it's not humble. I really appreciate... I got so much support. It was amazing because we did an I Am Spartacus thing. So, Liz, if you just stand up, thank you. And uh, this... <laughs> It was somewhat unplanned. I did a quick update on Facebook because I was being chased around by bailiffs in stab jackets um, for an action we did in 2014 when we occupied a field for three weeks. 26 grandma grandmas who took the field at five o'clock in the morning under the noses of security, even though some of them were a bit difficult to get across the wall. But we did it and uh, we left it clean and spotless and we left on the 26th of August 2014 and on the 27th they evicted us. An empty clean field. We'd done a fingertip search, 50 of us. Um, so all those costs were legal. I updated Facebook. A friend put up an event. Suddenly there were photographs of trees in Thailand with my name on them. People in Australia, lovely faces of people across the world being, I am Tina Rothery. And I was so touched. And 150 people turned up at court. Um, I'm pending the outcome. But I refused to pay because why would I give my money to a criminal? <laughs> and, and what did I do wrong? And... I was asked on the day to explain my financial situation, which is a laugh, and uh, there's nothing. I'm an activist, for God's sake. Um, I couldn't be poorer. Um, but I said I wasn't even going to tell them that because I refused to engage with a system that has nothing to do with justice. If my court and my, and my justice system was being used to serve justice, yes, I would engage. But this is not. This is about vindictiveness, about um, picking on me so that you won't stand up. It's about deterring activism. So I will not engage with the system. And I have just apologized and said, I'm sorry, I'm rude, but I'm not engaging, end of. And we're waiting to hear. The reason I don't talk about it is probably Assad's fault more than anyone, really, is because I don't often cry. And uh, I was at Friends of the Earth recently at base camp, and Assad spoke about um, the international, how different it is on an international front for activists. And I heard about death and despair and suffering and intimidation on a level that makes £55,000 look like a penny out of my pocket. What do I care? It's a couple of weeks in jail. I can do that. I'm obliged to do this job. And I'm obliged, I think as we all are, to raise my voice and be the voice for those who've been killed, those who are silent and those who aren't allowed to speak. We don't have much of a democracy. It pretty well sucks. But there's a semblance of it. And I won't get shot on a front line. So therefore, I must take that front line and shout with all my might for the quiet voices in the world. And I think that's what we all need to do. Yeah.